All right, I'm in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to be in verse 16 and making, making my way towards the end of the chapter. What, uh, what Paul is talking about here is the idea of being strengthened and that fundamentally we are strengthened by the love of God. Just to give you a little bit of a review here in verse 16, this is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. He says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. I spoke about this a little bit in the previous message, that this has to do with being strengthened in effect by the love of God. In verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. All right, now before I get into this, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about what people are doing when they are not strengthened by the love of God. What, what is it that we do when we're not being strengthened by the love of God? This, of course, is going to happen before we come to know the Lord, and the world is going to be trying to resolve some of these weaknesses that people have, all right? The discovery of weaknesses usually takes place when people are taken advantage of in some way, uh, or someone violates them or manipulates them. There are many different ways that people will relate to others in a way that is destructive when it comes to the idea of relationships, and can even, in a sense, cause harm to somebody else. But when people experience those kinds of things for themselves, then they recognize that they obviously have some weaknesses. You know, they have some weaknesses of some kind. And so there, there needs to be some kind of a resolution to the weakness of a person. And what most people will tend to do either intentionally or unintentionally. Usually it's because they, they don't really understand the, the, the source or the cause of the weakness and, and, and what's really going on. What people will do is they try to strengthen themselves by eliminating any sense of weakness that might be there. Okay, And of course, the, the two easiest topics to consider would be love and acceptance. I'm going to start with acceptance. It's a little bit easier to understand, I think, uh, because we all can relate to the desire to be accepted by others, right? We all have a deep desire to be accepted by others, but that obviously is not, you know, going to happen as often as we would like. It's going to just be a matter of time before a person experiences some sense of rejection, you know, from somebody else, some kind of rejection. And when that happens, then you're going to consider yourself to be unacceptable, you know, because that's how they relate to you. They relate to you in a way that uh, that you are unacceptable for, you know, certain things, other things, probably not. But those things that you may have an interest in, you know, in terms of the relationship with them, they might relate to you in a way that that uh, that they convey to you. They let you know that you are unacceptable to them. All right. So what what does a person do with something like that? Right. What is somebody what is it? What is it? This something what is something that somebody will do? Usually they want to strengthen themselves strengthen themselves in some way that uh, that other people uh, won't be able to reject them as easily, you know, because they 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 don't have uh, that much accessibility maybe to that person. You know, a person will will isolate themselves a little bit more and not expose themselves so much, not show other people who they are, you know, because they they, they don't want to feel the sense of rejection. So they'll strengthen themselves by controlling a little bit more uh, how they expose themselves to other people. You know, that's a reasonable approach that people take to try to try to uh, offset the the uh, the burden of the rejection that's most likely going to happen. 
You know, there are other people who will take the position or the attitude of, well, you know, I just I'm going to decide that whether this person is accepting of me or not is not going to have that much relevance. You know, it's just a decision that somebody makes. They're just going to uh, let that be a part of how they interact with this other person and part of their intent, part of their purpose, you know, and that can usually work to some extent when a person makes a determination that they're not going to allow their need for acceptance to be a part of the relationship that they're wanting to establish or maintain with somebody else. All right. But what what this all means, okay, no matter how people will try to strengthen themselves, uh, what this effectively means is they're going to suppress their need for acceptance. All right. That's indirectly what happens is that a person will will either intentionally or unintentionally, they'll acknowledge that maybe they have this deep need, maybe they won't acknowledge it so much, but it exists, all right? I mean, it is part of our design that we have a desire for these things, all right? And so what people will try to do is they try to manage those desires or suppress those desires Okay, that's that's the approach that, that, that people will take, which of course doesn't really work. All right. Doesn't really work. It's it's something that people will pursue and they try and they try to work it out and say, oh, I'm strong, you know, I'm strengthened because I've I've resolved that this is going to be who I am and, and, and what I want to be about. And this is my resolution concerning how I'm going to allow others to have access to my deepest needs, you know, and, and when people do this, if they obtain some impression that they have achieved success, you know, if they obtain that in some way, then what they really are just doing is they're deceiving themselves and they're deceiving other people. They're pretending that they that they are somebody who they are not. Okay. That's eventually in one way or another, that's what it becomes. It becomes a strength that is fundamentally pretend. Okay. And it will show, all right. It will show eventually in just a matter of time, it will show by the fact that they are going to experience a sense of rejection from other people. It's going to affect them. It's going to bother them. And they're going to recognize that they do have a deep need for acceptance. Okay. And so this is what people will do, which is ineffective in general. And it's only a matter of time before it is discovered that it is ineffective. Okay. And so people will tend to tend to withdraw themselves more and more from other people as a means of esteeming some sense of strength to protect themselves from the rejection because they have a deep need to be accepted. That's part of our part of our design. All right. The same thing with love. You know, we, we really want to be loved to such an extent that if somebody pretends that they love us or that they will love us, then we can be quite tempted by that. You know, even if we know that it's all pretend. We might still find ourselves being significantly tempted by something like that because we have a deep need for acceptance and love. You know, the, the, the desire for love is there. It is part of the design of God for us, you know, that we have been designed by God in this way. And so, and so when we recognize that this is kind of a problem, you know, because uh, there's some sin that results from that or some rejection that results from that in some way. Or we discover that the person was lying to us and deceiving us and just did not love us like they like they claimed. You know, there are going to be many opportunities in the world because that just simply is the nature of the world, you know, of lost people, people who don't know the Lord. This is how people relate to one another in many 
many different ways. And so when, all right, when the failure occurs and a person feels deeply unloved, you know, then they will want to strengthen themselves by suppressing their desire for love or by isolating themselves from other people uh, so that they're just simply not put in that kind of a situation or scenario again, all right? But this is not what God has called us to. He has called us to be strengthened, not by our intention or by our resolve, all right? We are to be strengthened by these needs that we have being met. We, we, you know, he designed us to meet these needs personally and that it is through his acceptance and his love for us that we will be strengthened. And the way that this works is that, is that he meets the deepest needs that we have in a spiritual sense to such an extent that, that, the, that the relationships that we have with other people will not have the same effect as they would have if we were not at peace with our God being loved and accepted by our God. We certainly can still feel a deep sense of rejection. You know, we can, do, we can feel that. We can feel that we are unloved, you know, or even unlovable, right? I mean, we can feel those things. But in knowing that we are loved and accepted by our God, right, that does change a lot about the degree by which we are weak or strong. Okay, either way. So if a person, all right, if a person has a distorted view of the love or the acceptance of God, Right? If a person has a distorted view, okay, a belief about how God loves them that is not real, it will just be a matter of time before they recognize that things just don't seem to be working out very well, you know, that they, that they are not feeling strengthened by the Lord at all. Okay? And this is a serious matter because most people in the religious world, in the religious context, believe that the love and acceptance of God is dependent on how well they get their flesh under control. All right? It's all based on what you do for God, you know, or what you don't do for God. And when you behave appropriately, you know, when you get your flesh under control, then you can perhaps be loved and accepted by God. It's all conditional. All right, but that is a distinct difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. That's how it was in the Old Covenant. That was the definition of the Old Covenant. And it was important, you know, for, for that to be experienced by humanity and for, it to, and for the effects, of course, to be well documented that we have in the Scriptures. We can see what happens with that. But when it comes to the New Covenant, we are loved and we are accepted by God because of what he has done for us, you know, and that's totally different. So when a person is not strong in the Lord, the place to look, you know, if you're experiencing this in, in some way, if you feel that you, simp you just simply are not strengthened by the love of God and by the acceptance of God, then it's probably because there are some things that you are believing that are distortions of reality, you know, that are simply not real and not true. And identifying these things is part of our growth and maturity in Christ Jesus. All right, so going back to verse 16, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. All right, and when his spirit is within you as part of salvation, you can have the beginning of an understanding of what it means to be loved and accepted by your God, especially when you understand that his spirit will never depart from your inner man, all right, because of what 
he has done for us. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, right, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. All right, so being filled with the fullness of God, to be strengthened by God, has to do with his spirit being in the inner man, the inner part of a person, your soul and spirit, to be present there so that you can be loved and accepted by him to be you know and to, and to start with that to you can experience that by by acknowledging his presence and resting in the truth of that all right so this is what he is dealing with at the end of chapter 3 that this is the foundation for what he's going to talk about in chapter 4 and it's also the, the the foundation through which we are strengthened and can walk in the new relationship that he has for us. All right, something that we can notice about this as well is that we have a God who desires to dwell in our hearts. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He has a desire to do that. For him to do that through faith, all right, Let's define faith a little bit in order to place it in this verse to give it a little bit more clarity. All right, that faith, I'm going to use the definition of faith being our response to the truth that he has revealed to us. Okay, faith is our response to the truth that he has revealed. He will dwell in our hearts through our response to the truth that he has revealed okay now through salvation we know that he's going to be present but this idea of dwelling you know and of living and of us experiencing him on a daily basis in our in our daily lives especially through the tribulations and sufferings of life that i mentioned a little bit in the previous message right it is through us responding to the truth that he has revealed that he will be able to do that. For example, you know, if you don't believe that God accepts you, all right, if you don't believe that, then how well is he going to be able to dwell in your heart, to be an integral part of your life, especially when things are going badly, you know, and if life is difficult and you're experiencing all kinds of struggles, all right, how are you going to be able to rest in his acceptance and his love for you if you just don't believe that he that he sees you that way? You know, and it's and it's normally because we uh, believe that his his acceptance towards us depends on how well we manage our flesh. OK, which is not how and why he accepts us. He accepts us because of what he did in the flesh of Jesus through forgiveness that we are now accepted by him. All right. When we are not and we're not resting this, we are not strong. We are weak and it will be reflected in the continual uh, you know, challenges and difficulties you would expect of somebody who was spiritually dead and didn't know the Lord at all. Okay, but when a person is strengthened by the love and acceptance of God because he dwells within them, all right, through the faith that they have because they believe and trust in what he has revealed, then there is a dwelling that they can have a living experience with one another. Right. You will be able to experience you will be able to have a living experience between yourself and your God when you believe the truth that he has revealed and he interacts with you on a daily basis in your life on the basis of that truth. All right. If you're believing things that are not true, what's he going to do about that? Right. What, what's he going to do 
in response to a lack of faith or a distorted faith, what's, what's he going to do? He's going to do nothing, right? I mean, he's, he's not going to do anything. He's going to wait until you believe what he has said concerning the truth, right? And when people start to realize that the Lord just does not seem to be dwelling within their inner person, you know, this is what they need to be thinking about. They need to think about what do they believe that is keeping them from understanding and embracing and believing in the love and acceptance of God. Instead, what people tend to do is redouble their efforts after they have lost sight of the goal. They redouble their efforts to try to get their flesh under control, hoping that one day God will love them. You know, one day God won't be so ashamed of them, you know, which just it goes nowhere. But for those of us who will experience a God dwelling within us through faith, legitimate, legitimate faith based on real truth that God has conveyed, then this will have a profound impact on who we are as a person. Okay, and this is what Paul is going to get into in the, in the, in the verses following is an understanding of the impact of this and how this has an effect on our lives. All right, let's go back to verse 19. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, which is an exaggeration to make the point that there is a way of embracing and understanding the love of God in a way that we can't really describe well. All right, I mean, there are some ways that we can describe knowing the love of God, but that there are others that we won't be able to easily describe or we won't be able to describe at all. It will be that which surpasses knowledge. So you start with the love of God that you can know based on knowledge, based on truth. You start there. You have to start there, you know, but that as we grow in that, there will be new and different ways that the Lord will reveal to us personally what his love really means for us. That becomes an individual experience. The idea of knowing the love of God according to knowledge is something that I can speak about, I can testify of, but that's my limit. You know, that, that, that's a limit, a limitation that, you know, I can participate in helping others to know the Lord by speaking about that which can be known. But there comes a point when there is more that you may know that cannot so easily be put into words and described in a knowledgeable sense. And that is your personal experience with your God, all right? Which is the way our God wants it to be. He wants these individual relationships, not a collective relationship based on a body of people who share a common set of knowledge. All right. That's a real problem. You know, there, I, I've, I know a lot of people who, who are, who are, you know, just really into the idea that everything about God has to be according to some definition of knowledge, you know, and, and they go so far as to, as to relate to God and relate to others completely as if, as if knowing him is some kind of <clears throat> extreme academic exercise of some kind. And there are some parts that certainly can be explored in that way, but, those, but, but that's very limited, you know, and people feel very comfortable, you know, in the, in, in the aspects that can be understood in a knowledgeable way. People feel very comfortable in that, and they feel uncomfortable in going beyond that to know their God in a way that surpasses knowledge. That is uncomfortable for them. They just don't want to go there. And for those who don't, I'll just say that you're, you know, you're just missing out. You know, you're missing out. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to take away from the, you know, the, the pursuit of knowledge, but at some point, you know, it's, it, for, for myself, there comes a point where, where I, I just simply stop and I say, okay, you know, 
that's just not going to be important to me because I am a little bit occupied with knowing my God as a person a little bit more. And, and those things don't always contribute to that. All right, so that just that's just discernment, and that's a personal experience. Going back to verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, all that we ask or think, all right, he's able to do anything and abundantly more than what we can think according to the power that works in us, all right? We're talking about a God who is able to do a lot, but he will do that according to the power that works in us, which is to say that he's going to do that according to his desire to dwell within the inner man, all right? So God is able to do a lot, but what he wants to do and where he wants his you know, his uh, energy and emphasis to be placed is in the issues related to, 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 to him working within us as a person that we might get to know him and be strengthened by his love. All right. I mean, I, you know, I understand that a lot of people have great interest in God doing many wonderful, miraculous things in the world that we're a part of, things like resolving conflicts or improving people's lives, you know, and, and I don't want to take that away. I just want to say that I think that, that people are, are misunderstanding that while some of these things he certainly is able to do, you may notice that that's just not what he does often, you know, if he does it at all, because his primary work is within the, the the individual who knows him according to the gospel, all right? And so what he is talking about here is what he is able to do abundantly within those who, who he dwells and within those who have a legitimate faith, who believe those things that really are true, he is able to do a lot with them. And those who are not resting in the truth that he has revealed, who are not experiencing him through legitimate faith, there just isn't a lot that he can do. All right. So going back to verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. All right. So that's the end of verse of, of chapter three. The end of chapter three is at verse 21. And, uh, and, and so I'm going to pause here that, that, you know, verse 20 has to do with the, with the, the, the ability of God to do many great things. If we will embrace the truth that he has conveyed to us. Okay, for those of you who are, you know, I'll just stop here and I'll go, I'll go into chapter four in the next message. For those of you who are using this for your small groups, I got a question that can facilitate some conversation. Have you ever felt your needs were weaknesses? All right, just a, 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 a way to get conversation started. Have you ever felt that your needs were weaknesses? You know, and, and, and how, how could you relate that to other people and what did you do you know in response to that how did you try to adjust to that or make corrections to that and i'll continue in the next message into chapter four thanks